if you're looking to heal most disease that is derived in the the gut and from leaky gut if you're willing to do all of the other lifestyle changes that it takes plantain can be an amazingly effective herb to help heal and repair all that damaged gut wall and the leaky little areas hello and welcome to the herbs with rosalie podcast a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine as food and through nature connection I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. For those of you who love practical herbalism, you're really gonna enjoy this episode. Mel Mutterspa shares so many simple and practical ways to work with plantain that you'll undoubtedly walk away with some new recipes and methods to try for yourself. For those of you who don't know Mel, she's a clinical herbalist, environmental educator, founder of the herbal products company, Mountain Mel's Essential Goods, podcast host at The Herbalist Path, and most importantly, a mom to a fun and silly nine-year-old daughter. Well, welcome to the podcast, Mel. I'm so happy to have you here. Thanks so much, Rosalie. It's an honor to be here. I'm really happy to be here. Well, you first did me the honor of having me on your podcast, and we had such a great time. We were just hanging out, chatting, talking about all the things that you and I both love, so it's really exciting to have you here. Yeah, it was really fun in that podcast to discover how many things we have in common with that really deep passion for nature and that connection. It's so important. So important, yeah, which I'm sure we're going to dive into today, but First, let's hear about you, Mel, and what got you started on this plant path. Yeah, actually, it was my connection and love for nature. So I was that kid always playing outside in nature, but I didn't have any idea that, you know, one day I would become an herbalist or anything like that. But I I did start studying environmental and experiential education and outdoor leadership, and I really just wanted to connect everybody with the power of nature and how it gave me so much humility and passion and awe and love. And I became a backpacking guide and wilderness therapist and got paid to take people to all these beautiful places. And I found that everybody was carrying all kinds of toxic, nasty junk in their backpacks and first aid kits. So I was like, this can't be. We have to start making natural first aid kits for the outdoor lovers. And I started diving into books and using other people's recipes and formulas. And that just kind of triggered in me like, hold on a second. These plants are on the same trails that these people are taking, are paying me to take them on. And then it just really snowballed into that. I started Mm -hmm. buying more and more books and taking some online courses. And I went to Brighton Bush Herbal Conference. And when I went there and connected with all these beautiful plant people, that's when I really, really knew like, this is what I've got to do. And Mm -hmm. ever since then, it's been a deep immersive dive and continuous learning. I think that's what I love about it. I'll never be bored with the study mm-hmm. of herbalism. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that one of your entryways is Brighton Bush because that gathering is such a special gathering, very near and dear to my heart too. Even though I've only made it a couple times, it is a memorable experience. Yeah, it's magical for sure. The the connection, the people, the land, certainly beautiful. I haven't been out since after the fires yet, but mm-hmm. I do need to go. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I was also, I love your, like, I bought a book and then another book. And I just, I have this very distinct memory of I had 11 herbal books. And I remember I had them like stacked all together. And I remember thinking like, I am so rich. Like I have 11 herbal books. I just thought that was the coolest thing. Like, I just remember that like feeling of like complete joy of like, look at what I have. And, and I just referenced them all the time. It was like my, you know, so all I did is pick up those books, pick up those books. And 
um, that's how it gets started. Now I have a few more books, but <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Behind me, there's a bunch of herb books there too, and I'm like, it's an addiction. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but definitely what I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that, just like that, you know, dipping your toes in and then taking the full dive. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a question I get all the time. Like, what books do you start with? And of course, I have your books and so many others. And one of these days, I'll have my own out. <laughs> I have no doubt about that. Yeah, it's exciting. Well, for today, you chose one of my very favorite herbs. And although all herbs are my favorite, I don't say that every episode. So <laughs> it's truly one of my favorites. One of the very first herbs that I learned so very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm curious what brought plantain here for you today. It's also one of the first herbs I really started exploring and studying in greater depth. Like my first herb school program was at the Elderberry School of Botanical Medicine in Portland, Oregon, and we had to do an in-depth plant study and mm -hmm. I chose plantain. And <clears throat> I think what has me talk about it here today is I'm one of those people in the camp of when in doubt plantain, because mm -hmm. you can use it. It's, it's claim to fame is like the bee stings and the bug bites or the skincare, but you can use it to help heal and repair, repair the damaged gut wall. You can use it to draw out infection, even mouth and tooth infections and snake venom and spider venom and just so many things. And it's a plant that is everywhere. I think that today as herbalism is gaining in popularity, which is awesome, it really needs to. One thing that is not awesome about it is it's also gaining this widespread, let's everybody go wildcraft everything and forget about the need to preserve these plants. But plantain is so abundantly there. Most people are trying to kill it in their yards. <laughs> If we can just raise that awareness of the power of this beautiful, beautiful medicine, then we can, we can change the world. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, actually, I have a lot of plantain growing in my lawn right now, and I love it so much. It is such a wonderful plant because it doesn't take a lot of care, and it's still soft because I like walking through the soft lawn. Mm -hmm. um, but now my lawn is mostly filled with herbs, you know, the yeah, low-growing type. Yeah. As well, it should be, right? Are you mm -hmm. more Plantago Major? I, funniest thing is I don't have much for plantain growing in my yard. I do have the Lanceolata, but the Major doesn't grow in my yard. I mean, I live on the Sandy River and my yard is very sandy soil, so mm -hmm. it doesn't grow well for me. <laughs> yeah, I have both. And that's actually a great place. Let's start. What what are these things that you're talking about? Plantago Major, Plantago Lanceolata? Yeah, so the Plantago Major, I like to think of it primarily, um, well, they both are somewhat interchangeable, right? They they are cousins, and one looks significantly different than the other. The Lanceolata has very long, lance-shaped leaves, so they're going to be anywhere from like five inches to, I've seen them almost up to two feet, if I'm just guessing without a, a, a ruler, and they look significantly different to just the regular eye, but they have so many medicinal properties that are similar, and one thing I think of the major for is for mouth and tooth infections specifically due to the doctrine of signatures like like treats like and the major almost looks like a tongue if you look at the shape of the leaf and so I kind of think and connect that big helper there like I like to use it with echinacea and spilanthes in a tincture and dilute it for a mouthwash for people um, <clears throat> when they've got major infections and I'm not sure if I completely answered your question in that way, but I do also know that I love to use the lanceolata with kids as nature's band-aid. It's nice and long so you can chew up the leaves and put it on an ouchie or a bee sting or a bug bite or whatever's going on and then use that leaf as a band-aid, not the chewed one, a new one, <laughs> as a band-aid wrapped around the, the finger. And that is just so much fun to share with kids. They are mm -hmm. always proud by it, so. Yeah. yeah, that was a great response. I was going for they are two different kinds of plantain, but what you shared was much better than that. So <laughs> <laughs> They are two different kinds of plantain, but they have very similar medicinal properties. Yeah, I'm always interested to hear how people use them differently. I use them just interchangeably, but the, the doctrine of signatures that the, um, the, I call it, you know, an egg shaped, the plantago major that looking like a tongue, that's brilliant. So 
Thanks for sharing. Yeah, I learned that from one of my first teachers, Scott Close. He was like, mm. this is for mouth and tooth infections. And I was like, oh, that, that can make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, such a great plant. I love it. Yeah. Um, so you've already shared a lot about how, um, I mean, all the many different ways of working with plantain. We, maybe we shouldn't say all because I think there is an endless amount, but many different ways. Uh, is there any that you'd like to expand upon? Yeah, I think one of the ones that absolutely blew my mind when I started diving deeper into the study of clinical herbalism, I was taking some classes with Paul Bergner and he was also having us do like an elimination re-challenge protocol that we would do with our clients. And he's who brought it to my attention that as plantain helps with the tissues of the skin and the respiratory tract, it's also extremely helpful for the digestive tract. So if you're looking to heal most disease that is derived in the, the gut and from leaky gut, if you're willing to do all of the other lifestyle changes that it takes, plantain can be an amazingly effective herb to help heal and repair all that damaged gut wall and the leaky little areas. Didn't go into that very eloquently, but <laughs> that's, that's what I love about plantain. So many people are seeking the gut healing and they forget to look at this very, very simple and abundant herb. Mm -hmm. And how do you like to work with it for the gut healing aspect? I put it in a tea um, just because you're not introducing more alcohol to the gut. Um, another way I love it is powdered with some calendula and powdered marshmallow inside some really good applesauce. So those that mm. don't like a tea but love a tasty little applesauce can really get a lot of cooling anti-inflammatory benefits to that. That's also going to heal and repair that damaged gut wall. It's super powerful. I used it in my one of my teas, digest teas, that it was just amazing. The results I would hear from people with that blend were just blown away. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I've never thought of that with the, or heard of that with the powder and the applesauce that is brilliant. Um, yeah. I'm not going to claim that one. That's a Paul Bergner Paul thing. Oh, well, well, nice. nice. <laughs> but yeah, the tea of plantain can be kind of intense, especially in larger dosages. It, it's not like a super strong tasting plant necessarily, but once you dry it and start adding more and more to it, it does have kind of a bitterness to it that's not like, yum. That's not yeah. what a lot of people say after they drink plantain tea. <laughs> no, they definitely don't say yum. And I think that's one of the the fun things to do the more you get into using plant medicine is to learn how to make that yum. I know you talk about that a lot through a lot of your programs and classes that you share. But the yum factor, I think, is really important and it can be really, really challenging. But the yum factor is what allows more people to use plants as medicine on a more daily lifestyle basis. So mm -hmm. it can be done. <laughs> it can be done. Yeah. 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 I don't think we could say enough about plantain for healing the gut. Like you're mentioning leaky gut or um, intestinal permeability. I think for me, I recommend or personally rely on plantain for any time. There's like, you know, anything that might come up, even just like minor or major digestive inflammation or prolonged diarrhea, post colonoscopy, when the intestines have just been like flushed out and kind of gone through some trauma there. It's like plantain, plantain. And as you mentioned, the calendula marshmallow too, is a wonderful combination. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, plantain, it's just, just one of those herbs that you can say, hmm, what do I have on hand? Plantain? Great. Let's use it. <laughs> you know, I can't think of very many times when I wouldn't want to turn to plantain. Can you? <laughs> yeah, that'd, be, that'd be a tough one yeah yeah i mean it really there are so many fabulous fabulous um uses for it yeah yeah even so many people get started in herbalism or at least their eyes open to plant world with the bee sting remedy I and mean, that's kind of what plantain is initially famous for yeah and, um just last year i, I retested that uh, it had been a while since I had, I got a uh, bee sting, but I was out in the garden and I got um, a couple of horsefly bites, which mm. those hurt, you know, like, so like, so pesky. Mm. yeah, they hurt bad. And so I got those on my arm and I was like, oh, you know, I'll just do a little test and I'll put a, you know, chew up some plantain and put it on one and compare them. And it was just so dramatic, the difference between the two. 
And I was just staring in my arm being like, whoa, that is just like amazing. It's so different. Like even after all these years, I'm still like, God, so cool. And then after a while I was like, Oh, I should probably just put some plantain on the other one now too, because it was like the other one was still throbbing and hard and red and you know, everything, and the other one had like pretty much gone away. And I was like, oh yeah, the, the experiment is over. <laughs> now I can you just can, like, take care I can of actually heal myself now. This is great. <laughs> I think that's so funny. I can absolutely relate to like what you're saying right there. You can study these plants for years and years and years, and then you know what they're doing. You can utilize them in practice. You can see them do their work but yet you forget how powerful they are or like what they can do for you. And you have to retest and you're like, I don't know. I continuously get my mind blown by them. When I was formulating all my products for my product line that I had, I would, you know, I, I formulated them like 14 years ago and I would completely forget about what's in them. And then I would hear from somebody how much it impacted their health and their life. And I'd be like, why is that? And then I'll go back and try the blend or look what's in my formula. And I'm like, oh yes, right. These plants do work. <laughs> They're really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny. I don't know why I turn back to that, but I do. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, and that's one thing to like repeat, like plantain's good for bee stings and, or whatever stings. And another thing, you know, just to get to live that again and again. And um, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those plants that my daughter has known since she was really, really young and she'll mm -hmm. teach her friends. But I remember we were at the park one time and her, she was like three and her friend got an ouchie and she walks over to a completely beat down, walked on, beat up plantain leaf and brings it over to her friend and her friend's parents are looking at her like, what is your <laughs> kid doing? <laughs> I'm like, I right now am winning as a mom because my <laughs> daughter knows how to use this plant. And um, it was just the coolest thing ever. And to this day, she, she knows, she knows mm, it so well. I love that so much. Yeah. yeah. It's a beautiful thing to share. <laughs> All right. So plantain, we've covered bee stings. We've covered how powerful it is for a digestive system. I'm really excited to hear about your recipe, wild, re wild weedy respiratory reliefy. <laughs> I get pretty cheesy with my names on things. I can't help it. But I wanted to share this one because we've talked, like I said, about the, the skin and the digestive tract, which are all mucosal tissue, which are very similar to the mucosal tissue of your respiratory tract. And plantain can be a really great, helpful herb in that department as well. It's slightly demulcent and can just provide a lot of help when it comes to having a dry, irritated, scratchy throat. And when I created this recipe for this show, I was recovering from my first battle with COVID. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I was using plantain and I used some other friendly herbs in there because as you were saying, plantain is not delicious. <laughs> um, but you can add other herbs in that are really going to enhance the medicinal benefits and the flavor. So I did plantain leaf and elecampane root and marshmallow, all which are powerhouses for the respiratory tract. But then for like yumminess and flavor factor, I added in anise seed and fennel seed. Um, <clears throat> I love to use licorice root in this blend as well. I absolutely love licorice, but it's not a great herb for anybody dealing with high blood pressure or who is pregnant or dealing with edema. So you can use the licorice root optionally. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is kind of a big conglomeration of herbs that I had on hand. And I was like, this dry sore throat is not helping and I want it gone. So I also put in some mullein leaf. I did some uh, Western Colts foot, which grows abundantly where I am. And then lungwort, the lichen, which is another one of my absolute favorite respiratory friends in mm. the world. So it's a little bit sweet and it is super duper cooling and just eases that yuck factor from a dry, scratchy irritated throat. And you're making, I don't know if we said this is a tea blend, right? Yes. Yes. And um, yeah, I can imagine it just being very soothing and coating and those, um, those dry coughs, they can just be the worst. So yeah, this is wonderful. Yeah. They're super uncomfortable. And I was supposed to be teaching classes and recording podcasts and I'm like, I can't talk. 
-hmm. but the blend really, really helped a lot. And it was not disgusting to drink either. So <laughs> win, win. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that recipe with us. And for the listeners, if you'd like to download your free recipe card and handout, then you can visit the show notes at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com. Yeah. Well, what else would you like to share about plantain with us, Mel? It is an herb to get to know. It is an herb to use. I love to dry some each year when the leaves are nice and young before the flowers are really up and doing their thing. You can add it to salads and your food early in the spring if you wish. You can make a tincture of it. I have a really fun story. I was having this friend of mine built us a new woodshed on our property. And he was this rough and tough carpenter, like, you know, manly man, mountain man. And we were making him dinner and he comes in and he's like, I've got this splinter in my thumb and it's just not coming out. And I'm like, great. I've got some plantain tincture. Hold on. And I could see him looking at me like, okay, crazy hippie Mel, like, whatever. Sure. I'll do it. And so, you know, I got a cotton ball with some of the plantain tincture and I put it on his thumb and we continued to chat and babble as dinner was being made. And like 15 minutes later, I'm like, so, so how's that splinter? And he was like, oh, I completely forgot. And he takes off the bandaid or the, the cotton ball and the splinter comes right out on the cotton ball. And his mind was just like, Oh no way. <laughs> I think I turned him on to plant medicine from there on. It's just so cool in that way. And then another time I had used it, I was out hiking in the woods around my property and I got a big thorn from a blackberry shrubbery in the back of my leg and I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, whatever, I don't care. It's just whatever. <clears throat> and I ignored it for several weeks until I like look back because it was like in that area of my calf where you just don't really look at mm -hmm. and it was red and swollen and I'm like okay Mel this is infecting getting infected you need to do something and so I did the same thing with the plantain tincture and put a cotton ball and a band-aid over there and took it off a little while later and this just ginormous blackberry thorn came out of my leg <laughs> it's wow. just such a cool cool plant to work with and just the fact that it's there for you. It's all over the place. It's known as white man's footprint because people cannot get rid of it wherever we step. You can find it in sidewalk cracks. You can find it on the side of the road. It, it's in your neighbor's lawn. You know, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazing. Just try not to chew the ones that you think maybe your neighbor's dog peed on or anything like that. Good call. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think I could... I can and I will talk about plantain for the rest of my life, but I don't want to like just bombard your whole show on mm. the magic. Oh, plantain. there's so much there. I've never used the tincture and cotton wood or cotton ball before. I've done more complicated things like mixing plantain tea or tincture with clay and then putting that over the area or doing a poultice. But I'm gonna try this because that sounds way easier. So Super I simple, was, like, easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's great. The clay poultice is a great way to go too, though. But yeah, if you've already got it preserved and ready to rock, why make more mess, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm always down for simple. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mel, I'd love to hear about what projects you're working on these days. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about my next project. I'm creating a program called Apothecary Mama, and it's just going to be a go-to resource for all the moms out there that are seeking more natural remedies and how to use them in a safe and effective way mm. without like getting super overwhelmed by searching Google all day long or checking out the latest meme to find out what's the best thing to do and then finding out that it may not work for you. So really excited about that. We've been building that out on the back end and so far it's looking great. And it's one of those things I wish I had when I was a new mom. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. That sounds so important. Um, since I'm not a mom and didn't work a lot with the mom population, in practice, that's not an area of my strength. So I get a lot of questions, you know, is this safe during breastfeeding? Is this herb safe during pregnancy? And I um, have seen, you know, like you said, the memes, the Facebook groups, where a lot of just really poor information gets shared, both in both camps, like both the like, 
take this miracle. It's for everybody. You know, it'll change everybody's life. Oh, by the way, I'm selling it to um, <laughs> you know, like all herbs, you know, will kill you if you take it, you know, like the other side of like, oh, you cannot do anything, you know, no herbs during pregnancy, no herbs during breastfeeding. And, you know, sometimes these things like people would be like, wait 10 years after you give birth and then you can take herbs again. I mean, that's <laughs> you know, but the, the fear is around that. So having a trusted source is so important. And also just the overwhelm. I mean, when you like yeah. hit, you know, the online world trying to get that, you know, crowdsourced advice, the the over, it can seem so nice at first, like, whoa. And then it's just so, such overwhelm. So. It really does get overwhelming because you'll hear like five people say, take this herb. They really have no context behind why to take that herb. And then the next person will be like, nope, you can't take that herb. It's toxic. It'll kill you or something just ridiculous. And I just wanted to create apothecary mamas so that more moms can start to use plants as medicine in a really safe and effective way. Because I know the curiosity is out there. There are moms that are dying to know this information and they're, you know, overwhelmed in Facebook groups or overwhelmed by searching Dr. Google, because you can look on there and you can see 10 answers to one issue on the same Google page. And then, you know, some person says, use this plant and five other people say it. And then there's the person that says, oh, I heard that plant is toxic. And like, how do you navigate that information, especially when you're a busy mom who's got to do the laundry and pick up the kids when they're crying and take them to their sports and, you know, all of the things. <laughs> so I just really want to help I'm on a mission to help there be an herbalist in every home. And there's no better person to start with than mama who can then pass that down to her kiddos and they can make remedies together. And she can share with that kiddo why that plantain is so important to know inside the park. Like this information used to be passed down from generation to generation. And it's our job today to continue to make that happen. So yeah, I just want to have safe resources for mamas from pregnancy all the way to emptying the nest for mm -hmm. all the many, many issues that come up during that time of life that tend to always fall on mama's shoulders. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, wow, that's a wonderful mission. Well, very well stated, Mel. Thanks. Yeah, it's it's exciting. And as you know, it's a good bit of work to create it all, but super, super worth it. Yeah. So is this going to be like a database or is it like a course or? So it's a little of both. It's going to be a course where we teach them medicine making, like all your basic medicine making skills, doing it folky ways and bringing more of the science and measurements and structure into it. But then it's going, so that's like the primary foundation so they can build off of that. And then I'm going to have a whole section where it's based on life stages. So starting with pregnancy to infancy to toddler years, the primary years and teens and tweens as they go through all of the hormonal wackoness that is bound to happen. Just the different things that happen in those phases. We share the herbs that you can use. I share a recipe for like, let's say there's cradle cap you're dealing with and there'll be a little quick lesson where I'm like, this is what's happening with cradle cap and why it's happening. These are the kinds of herbs that you can choose to use to help this issue. Here's a recipe I've used, but here's really more the knowledge on how you can choose other herbs, especially if you don't have something on hand that's in the recipe. That's where I think moms can really get wise and intuitive and have this like peaceful inner knowing that they're doing the right thing for their babies and their kiddos. So I'm gonna have it by life stages and then also by body systems. So let's say we go back on that cradle cap, you can go into skin issues and you can search cradle cap. So it's basically like a lifelong encyclopedia for moms. <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, I'm excited for it. And then we're also gonna do like live monthly calls where they can ask, ask an herbalist basically, oh, yeah. No. And for folks who are interested, where's the best place to get more information about Apothecary Mama? 
You can check me out at theherbalistpath.com. That's the best place. We're still building it out, as I was saying. And I do a lot of things on TikTok these days, also Mm -hmm. under The Herbalist Path. I've been having a blast over there, which I never thought I would do. (laughs) But it's really fun. And yeah, I get a lot of mm, communication and get to help a lot of people over there. It's really fun. Wonderful. Any other projects you're working on right now, Mel? Yeah, I've actually got a cold and flu busters from your kitchen cabinet free download for your listeners. I just think that we kind of underestimate the power of the medicine that we already have on hand. Mm -hmm. And if more people start to understand that even our food is medicine, including the spices, then we're going to have a better world. You don't have to go out and spend tons of money to start your herbal apothecary when you understand that you already have one. Yeah, so that can be found at theherbalistpath.com forward slash cold and flu busters. Yeah, perfect. I'll put that link in the show notes as well. Thanks for sharing that with everybody, Mel. Well, before you go, I have one last question that I'm asking everybody in season five. And that question is, in what ways do you think herbalism is misunderstood by the general public? This is a big one, and there's a few ways I could look at it, but I think one that I feel needs to be addressed and spread more out to the masses is thinking of herbs as we think of Western medicine. Like you can take this herb to fix this problem. I know you hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. Hey, Mel, what herb can I take for X, Y disease or um, whatever may be going on with them? But the reality is that these herbs are extremely complex and that you are extremely complex. Your symptoms are really complex and learning how to balance and integrate those together so that the plants can work best for you is really, really powerful. And it's completely understandable why people think of this because we are raised with this Western medicine mentality of you take this pill and it fixes this problem. Never mind the long list of side effects that may or may not come up in your body. <clears throat> but that's how we're taught to think about things. And just if, if people could understand that it's significantly more complex than that, there are energetics of the herbs and energetics of your body and of the symptoms you are dealing with to work with in that whole realm. So, um, yeah, I could go on and on and on mm-hmm. about that, but that's a, a big one for me. Um that I think is really misunderstood in our whole entire industry. That, and you know, you see it all the time, the meme thing, this herb's gonna cure everything. (laughs) And it gets passed around and, and, and suddenly it becomes this gigantic fad herb. And one thing that comes about with that is that fad herb then gets completely raped and pillaged from the land and comes to a point where the only way to really sustainably source it is to either grow it yourself or to ensure that you're gathering it from a really high quality organic herb farmer. Um, But it's just, it's sad because then those plants are going away for future generations and Mm -hmm. and we need these plants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Those are two very good points. And, um, and like you said, plantain is not at high risk for being over harvested um but so many plants are and yeah it makes me think of like this one time i was looking at some kind of herbal it was mass produced herbal shampoo and they had echinacea in it and i was like why is there echinacea in this shampoo i mean there's just no reason for that and i can't even you know it's a mass produced shampoo so i can't even imagine how many plants went into that even if it was like the last ingredient and they were just like putting a drop in it was still too much because there's just no reason for that but yeah. that's what happens when those plants get popular like that, like you were saying, it's like they start to trend and then, you know, companies want to jump in on that trend and be like, you know, our shampoo has echinacea. Um, and it's just, yeah, not, not a good thing. Yeah. It's everywhere. And just like that, that's a perfect example. And you look at this formula and you're like, do you have, whoever formulated this really has no idea what they're doing other than picking something trendy. Mm-hmm. Like it's, um, it's really fascinatingly sad, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Well, and that was beautifully stated, Mel. Thanks so much for sharing that. Thanks so much for taking the time to be here. It's always a pleasure to be in conversation with you. 
Yeah, it's an absolute honor to be here. Thank you so much. It's been really, really fun. Again. <laughs> Again. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to Mel's recipe for wild, weedy, respiratory reliefy. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can find Mel at The Herbalist Path on TikTok and online at TheHerbalistPath.com. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview and this wonderful wild weedy herb. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.